Curriculum for Excellence is the biggest programme of educational change that Scotland has seen for many years. Its effects are potentially very far-reaching. Yet all too often we focus on the minutiae of the programme and neglect the fundamental issues. Why is it needed? What is it designed to achieve? Is it just about schools or will it affect education more generally? To answer these questions, we must go back to its origins in the national debate on education in 2002. 25,000 people took part in that debate, mainly parents. The views expressed varied widely, but some clear messages emerged. Most people thought that Scotland's schools were doing a good job. But they also saw a need for change. The world was changing, rapidly, in ways that would affect the lives of every young person. So education had to change too. Fundamentally, therefore, Curriculum for Excellence is Scotland's educational response to global change. It is about equipping people to deal successfully with the challenges of the early 21st century. So what are these challenges and what are their implications for education? One of the most important is globalisation and the need to be competitive internationally. A sophisticated, high-wage economy like Scotland's cannot compete on scale of production, still less on price. It has to be creative, constantly innovating, and capable of operating near the cutting edge of knowledge. Of course, there will still be low-paid jobs for poorly qualified people, but there will be fewer of them. 400 disappear in the UK every single day. More promisingly, good craft skills are still in demand, and probably always will be. But as a country, we will be competitive globally only if we have a large and ever-increasing proportion of the workforce able to operate in the knowledge economy and at the highest level of skill. This is a formidable task for education. Knowledge is expanding at an ever-accelerating rate. This in itself is another challenge for education. At the very least, it calls for content to be constantly updated. But, much more fundamentally, it also changes the very purpose of education. There is no longer any realistic possibility that schools or colleges or universities can give their students a complete toolkit of knowledge and skill that will see them through later life. Now the task is to equip people to be lifelong learners and, perhaps even more important, to motivate them to want to go on learning. The exponential increase in knowledge poses another challenge too. New knowledge brings new issues, often in the form of previously unimagined ethical dilemmas. Think, for example, of the life sciences, stem cell research, performance-enhancing drugs, genetic engineering. Full of useful possibilities, but also capable of transforming society in ways that we didn't foresee and may not wish. So we have to remember that we are not just educating workers, but also citizens. People with the knowledge and skill, but also the inclination to try to ensure that society chooses wisely. As well as workers and citizens, we are also educating unique human beings. Will they thrive and enjoy fulfilling lives in this world of constant, ever faster change? Can education give them the self-confidence, the adaptability and the strong values that such an environment requires? Back in 2002, when people said that education needs to change because the world is changing, it was issues like these that they had in mind. And the Curriculum Review Group that produced Curriculum for Excellence two years later had them in mind too. As a result, Curriculum for Excellence portrays education as having four purposes. Its task is to develop people as successful learners, confident individuals, effective contributors and responsible citizens. These aims weren't intended to apply only to young people at school. The Curriculum Review Group's remit was to formulate principles to underpin the curriculum from age 3 through 18 and into lifelong learning. The focus of the subsequent development programme may have been mainly, but not exclusively, on schools, but the principles were always intended to have wider application. 
They apply to very early childhood, not just from three, but from birth, or perhaps even shortly before. They apply to every kind of lifelong learning, in formal settings like colleges and universities, and in less formal settings like those provided by community learning and development. Community learning and development is about building social capital. It seeks to support communities by increasing skills, promoting confidence, building networks and enabling collaboration. This is just another way of describing the four purposes of Curriculum for Excellence. And the same applies to the learning of the individual. The person of whatever age enrolling in a course of basic skills or taking part in a volunteering project, what are they trying to be if not successful learners, confident individuals and so on? Curriculum for Excellence is badly named. It is not a curriculum, at least if you envisage a curriculum as being a catalogue of content, things to be learned. Curriculum for Excellence is, firstly, a mission statement. It sets out a vision and it gives Scottish education a long-term sense of direction. It will not be implemented over the next few years. The quest to help people become successful learners and so forth will go on for as long as any of us can envisage. Secondly, Curriculum for Excellence is a programme of improvement with many strands, teaching styles, assessments, relationships with learners. I want to touch just briefly on three aspects of that programme that I consider particularly crucial. Firstly, in the modern world, knowledge remains vital but it is not enough. Success depends on deep understanding and on having the skills to turn knowledge to useful effect. So deep learning and the development of skills are critically important. CLD has a good record in promoting skills of many different kinds. In the modern world, the emphasis needs increasingly to be on advanced, transferable, cognitive skills like problem solving, critical thinking, and creativity. Secondly, Curriculum for Excellence attaches increased importance to interdisciplinary learning. Subjects are still important. Indeed, the structure of knowledge is perhaps more important than ever. But at the same time, we have to remember that knowledge is joined up. The problems of life are seldom solved by using expertise from a single subject area alone. Being able to draw on different areas of learning and apply them together in real-world contexts is a vital skill. And again, CLD has real strengths here. Finally, a surprise benefit of Curriculum for Excellence development has been a new emphasis on learner engagement. The idea that the learner has to take responsibility for his or her own progress and needs to be involved in all of the key decisions. This kind of active involvement in the learning process wasn't a significant part of the original plan, but it has been enthusiastically taken on board by schools. And of course, it has always been a feature of good community learning. So there are three key features of Curriculum for Excellence in practice, and in every instance, CLD has strong foundations on which to build. But there is a very long way to go, all learning has to become more ambitious. Every country in the developed world knows this. Nearly everyone has produced a new mission statement for education, its own version of Curriculum for Excellence. And many of the elements of Curriculum for Excellence are to be found elsewhere. So everybody shares the objectives, but nobody has yet made the breakthrough to genuine 21st century practice. That is the task that faces us.